Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Real solutions. And that we can and should prioritize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Please, please sit down. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you, Tom. So Tom was telling me as we were walking in that you've had a good morning. So I'm glad that I'm walking into people in a good mood. So anyway, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your work and your efforts to foster a more constructive, respectful dialogue in our debates. And Joe is, is so grateful for uh, your leadership. And so I have to say that um, Governor Cox, I want to say uh, I'm grateful to you and Abby for the warm welcome in Utah last month. So good morning, everyone. And it's great to be here with all of you. And Governor Scott, when I visited Vermont last year, what you said really stayed with me. You said pure partisan politics has never contributed to real solutions and that we can and should prioritize progress over politics, especially on issues where the majority of Americans agree. That majority is an exhausted one. I think you've seen that, as Governor Cox often points out. They're frustrated by a Congress that is often mired in gridlock, and those who too often treat government like a sport with an us versus them mindset and a knee jerk reaction to oppose anything, you know, the other team supports. But this room shows the nation something different. And I wish that the lawmakers on the Hill would follow your lead. You show that we can turn down the volume, stop the shouting, and actually listen to one another. That yes, as Governor Cox says, we can disagree without being disagreeable. As many of you know, I've been teaching writing for 40 years, as Tom referenced. So one day, a student named Harry, who wanted to be an auto mechanic, raised his hand. Dr. B, he said, the only thing I need to learn how to write is needs breaks. He was, well, you finally got it. Come on, wake up. So he was joking, of course, but he had a point. He wasn't just there to learn the art of writing. He was there to help prepare himself for a good paying job. For most people, a high school diploma alone isn't enough to find a great career. But they don't often need a four-year degree to pursue their passions either. And as technology brings changes to so many industries, these kind of learning paths are more important than ever. Since he took office, my husband, President Biden, has been focused on rebuilding the middle class. I'm sure you've all heard him say that in your states. And today, millions of new jobs in infrastructure and clean energy and manufacturing are being created. We will need to train a new generation of workers to fill those jobs. And these positions pay well. And many of them require associate degrees or certificates or other hands-on instruction, not four years of college. Still, a lot of high school students don't necessarily know how to get from earning their diplomas to earning a living. They may not even know what roles are out there. And that's why we need to transform education so that it does a better job for preparing students for careers. Nearly 60% of graduating high school students don't go to a four-year college. 60%, six out of every 10 students. Are high schools designed to meet the needs of those students, the majority who don't go directly to a four-year university? Too many schools aren't. 
yes, we should still expand access and affordability you know, for students who want to go immediately to a four-year college after high school. But we also need to dramatically expand the opportunities that we provide for students who may pursue something else. And that means that everyone has a chance to explore future careers in high school. Career-connected learning meets that need. And I've seen it around the country. In Wisconsin, Governor Evers is scaling a model for starting apprenticeships in high school in fields from finance to nursing. In Vermont, Governor Scott is investing in dual enrollment and free community college. And in Indiana, I saw how students are getting training for careers in clean energy. These states show us what it looks like when students have access to comprehensive career advising, when they are able to take community college courses in high school and even earn a credential, and when they can earn high school course credit for working at a job. I believe in evidence-based models, not just theories, and we know that this works. An Oregon study found that students who concentrated in particular career area graduated high school at higher rates and went on to earn higher wages. So you're probably saying, I mean, I know a lot of you are doing this, so what can you do? You can build out and grow career-connected programs in your state. And I know, like I said, many of you are already doing this because I've been to your states to see the programs. Some of you are providing uh, comprehensive career advising. Some are prioritizing access to dual enrollment between you know, high school and community college. And some have impressive programs that allow students to work in real workplaces as part of their high school curriculum. And some states are expanding credentialing opportunities so that students can work toward obtaining a career qualification while in high school. But not enough states are doing all these things all at once for every student. So that's what's crucial in unlocking the potential of career-connected learning. So I'm asking all of you, if you're not doing this already, to lean in. Go to the businesses in your state and tell them how apprenticeships can boost productivity and reduce turnover. Go to your community college and K through 12 leaders and work with them to expand dual enrollment opportunities that connect all students to good paying jobs. And use my office, use me as a resource. Reach out to us. Let us know how we can help you lift up the great work that you're already doing. And I hope that when this group gathers next that you know, we have even more successes to show. So thank you for listening this morning. I appreciate it. But before I go, I want to come around. You have this card on your table. OK. You all have. So you know the lights are in military families. My dad fought in World War II. My son, Bo, went to Iraq. So in, oh, thanks. <laughs> I have a teacher voice. I don't need this. So I want to give you a little homework. So there are 15 million military-connected kids across our country. These kids need access to services. So I want you to take a look at your state and make sure that these kids are uh, counted in your high school's sent con yeah. Consensus is, so, thank you, yeah, thanks. So, so, that, um, so that they can get the, everything that they need. You know, they need so many programs and help. And so if you can do that one more thing, I'd really appreciate it. And I, I know that your hearts are there. So I wanna thank you beforehand for you know, taking this to heart. This is your homework. So thank you so much for listening today. Thanks. Progress over politics. 
especially on issues where the month. So good morning, everyone. And it's great to be here with all. Who often treat government like a sport with an us versus them. And Joe is, is so grateful for uh, your leadership. Food. So anyway, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your work and your effort. Uh, I'm grateful to you and Abby for the warm welcome in Utah last. Walking in that you've had a good morning. So I'm glad that I'm walking into people in a good mood. Majority of Americans agree. That what you said really stayed with me. You said pure Congress that is often mired in gridlock, and those who too very much, thank you, please, please sit down, thank you. Thanks, all of you. And Governor Scott, when I visited Vermont last year, Governor Cox often points out, they're frustrated by a So thank you, Tom. So Tom was telling me as we were walking to foster a more constructive, respectful dialogue in our debates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. The majority is an exhausted one. I think you've seen that. As 